Okay. Then we'll just go. Hi, everybody, and welcome to SIG Usability's community update here at KubeCon North America 2020. What we've been focused on is st really kicking off SIG's usability over the past year and getting some of our first projects off the ground. And we're excited to be able to share with you both what we're doing here at SIG Usability, why the Kubernetes community has decided to kick off SIG Usability in the first place, and then some of the projects that we're working on, as well as how you can find us in the upstream community and get engaged. Uh, just to introduce myself really briefly, I'm Tasha Drew. I am the Director of Product Incubation at VMware, and I am the co-chair of SIG Usability, and I'm also the co-chair of the Working Group for Multi-Tenancy and Kubernetes. Uh, my name is Gabby, Gabby Marino Cesar. I'm at IBM. I uh, started contributing to SIG Usability about a year ago when it got started, um, and uh, I'm a UX designer on the Kubernetes design team. I'm Carl Pearson. I am a UX researcher formerly at Red Hat, and I've been involved with the SIG for uh, about half a year now. Cool. So uh, when we kicked off SIG usability, it was for uh, a very sort of uh, silly reason initially, which was that uh, at VMware, we've been working on vSphere and Kubernetes, and we had a bunch of icons that we've open sourced um, as part of a clarity.design project. And so we were wondering what the upstream iconography for Kubernetes was and if we could work with them to have upstream icons to figure out like if I'm looking at something is it a container is it a cluster is it a node uh, and then as we sort of as I sort of dug through the various mailing lists kind of ask my question uh, it started this torrent um, on the mailing list about how we really as a community as an upstream Kubernetes community needed to make usability more of a top level focus um, and some so from from that, uh, we realized that we needed to form a special interest group, which in the Kubernetes upstream community is how we uh, organize contributions, basically. Uh, so here we see back in 2019, uh, Newstack had a sort of evergreen article about how UX is Kubernetes' biggest short-term challenge. Uh, we really see from people who are adopting Kubernetes that uh, getting started and understanding how to use the project and understanding how to manage life cycle and extensions can all be pretty confusing. Um, additionally, here's a study from Newstack also in 2019 uh, saying top areas the Kubernetes project needs to address in 2020. And we see at the top really two things that can be pretty tightly coupled to core usability issues, which is core Kubernetes needs to start thinking about the administrator operational experience of operating Kubernetes and also the developer experience of deploying applications and automating their lifecycle on Kubernetes. So from this data and from our own experiences as creators of Kubernetes um, and as users and implementers of Kubernetes, we realized that we really needed to make usability a top level concern in the upstream community uh, to make sure that we were enabling people to really use Kubernetes in the way that it could be if it was a little more user friendly. So where to find us? So uh, in the upstream community, uh, the Kubernetes community is organized into SIGs or special interest groups. Um, and so currently we have three chairs of SIG usability, myself, Gabby, and Himanshu. Um, if you want to engage with us, what I would really suggest the best first step to be is to go to Google Groups. So just type groups.google.com in your browser uh, and look up SIG-usability Kubernetes and you'll find our, our Google Group. Uh, this is really a mailing list and the mailing list is how we organize everything such as sending out calendar invitations, uh, having group conversations around various projects we're working on, sharing links, sharing documents. So if you're on the Google group, uh, you'll get the invitations to our regular meetings. You can attend those meetings. They're open to the public. Uh, you'll be able to see our meeting minutes. You'll be able to see our notes. You'll be able to see links to interesting things that we're working on. So I really 
I don't want to undersell the Google group because that should really be your first step. If you're like, oh, this is a cool group of people working on things I'm interested in. I'd like to kind of understand, maybe to start participating. Uh, Google group is really the best uh, first step. The other thing I'd like to call out, uh, and this applies to every Google group, is that when you join the Google group, you will not immediately get the calendar invitation. Um, there's some lag in the system. Uh, and so just, just be patient. It may take up to five days because, you know, maybe there's a carrier pigeon involved in the back end. I have no idea. Um, but you will eventually get this calendar invitation that will uh, allow you to join our regular meetings here at SIG Usability. Um, some other places you can find us, uh, we do have a page uh, on the Kubernetes-SIG, so we have a repo there where we're starting to use the project tracker and highlight some of the work that we're working on, um, and so uh, that's a good spot to kind of check out. Um, then we also post all of our videos to YouTube. Um, you'll find these meeting notes, the link that I posted here, um, you'll also have uh, edit access to when you join our Google group. Uh, and finally, there is a Kubernetes Slack where all of the upstream maintainers have various channels for their SIG and um, different organizing functions. So you can join the Kubernetes Slack channel and then we have a SIG usability channel there where you can also talk to us. Um, so. TLDR, join the Google group. Um, the link's at the bottom of this page. Uh, we'd love to see you at our meetings, uh, and we definitely are always interested in seeing new ways that people seek to address and improve um, upstreams, projects, usability, um, and also uh, involve you in some of our projects. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to Gabby uh, to lead us through something that we've been working on recently. Thanks, Tasha. Uh, so I'm going to be giving an overview of one of the projects that we have um, going on. Uh, we're calling it our Jobs to be Done study. Uh, a little bit of background first, just about you know my open source contributions. Um, I hadn't contributed to open source before, and so about a year or so, um, you know, this opportunity came up, so usability started, um, and I just saw it as a really cool opportunity to be able to. Um, do this type of user research um, as part of open source. And with Tasha's help and Carl, um, we've been able to put together uh, this really great team around this project. Um, the main questions that were that Jobs to be Done is kind of trying to answer is one, like who's using Kubernetes? Um, but mo most importantly, like for those people, what are they trying to achieve with Kubernetes? Um, you know, Kubernetes is the technology, but like, what are they trying to do? And, you know, what other options did they consider before deciding on Kubernetes? Um, how did, they, once they do adopt Kubernetes, how do they go about kind of like working towards um, that objective or that goal? Uh, and ultimately at the end of this, we're trying to um, figure out what are the top opportunities for, um, for the open source community to be able to improve Kubernetes. And we have a pretty uh, good set of people here, um, myself, Tasha, Carl, Josie from Pivotal, and then Boaz as well. For those of you that haven't heard of Jobs to be Done, um, you know this is kind of like the my favorite way of explaining it is that um, people don't want a quarter inch drill, uh, drill being the technology, they want a quarter inch hole. Uh, so, you know, an example of this could be like, if someone's trying to drill a hole and they had an adjustable lightsaber uh, to, to do that, you know, they would buy the lightsaber instead of the drill. So if you focus just completely on building this like perfect quarter inch drill, you kind of miss the, the point or, or the opportunity to be able to help somebody just drill that perfect quarter inch hole. <laughs> so um, this is a pretty, industry standard uh, approach and methodology. Um, we, we just wanted to call out the two sources that we've been uh, referencing, mainly um, this book, Jobs to be Done by Rosenfeld Media, um, and then also Jobs to be Done by uh, Tony Ulwick, who, um, who started the, the firm Stratagen. And so they're really well known for, for doing this approach as well. And just to cover some of the jobs to be done, uh, kind of like standard terminology, we have the job, job being like you want to drill the, the quarter inch hole, or you want to prepare a meal, for example, um, if we took the meal example and um, kind of like looked at the steps involved into making a meal, you don't just make a meal, like you need to go to the grocery store, you need to, um, or maybe like do like an online service or something like that to figure out like, 
first, what, what are you gonna make? Uh, then what do you need in order to make it? Um, double check that you have the right amount of everything and then you can make a meal. <laughs> and if you like the meal, um, you know, you may conclude that uh, it was a good meal and that you'll make it again, or you may decide that this was not the best and <laughs> better luck next time. Um, and that's kind of like the, the highest level concept behind jobs to be done is that you do your analysis around this job. Um, the other concept that's important to call out is this idea of a desired outcome, which again goes back to the drill, the quarter inch hole, uh, not the drill. And so if we take a music example, um, an example here is let's minimize the time it takes to get songs in the desired order for listening. And if you kind of like look at this statement, it feels like very specific. Um, and the reason is that it is, um, you know, we have um, the reason that it's structured this way. And again, this is from jobs to be done is because, um, you know, after you do qualitative interviews to to figure out like, what's the job? What are the steps? Um, this kind of like informs a survey that you send out with all these desired outcomes. And you gen end up generating maybe like 100 to 150 of these. Um, and what happens is that when you send this survey out, you ask people, um, you know, how important is this to you? Uh, also, how satisfied are you with your ability to do it right now? And so, you know, you, you get people's input on these very um, structured statements. And uh, what ends up coming out of this is this really amazing um, opportunity landscape. So if you look here um, at, at the little, at the quadrants, you have everything from overserved, um, overserved being that people were very satisfied um, and it's not very important. <laughs> so probably don't wanna focus on that. But then on the opposite spectrum, you have um, outcomes that are very important to people and they're not very satisfied with how they're done today. And so what we call those is um, underserved. Uh, you, you know, it's very important to people to be able to do these. They're not satisfied. And so you as a project or you as a community, how can you better serve these? Uh, and then you have everything in the middle, which is like mid importance and mid satisfaction. Um, so what we've done so far, um, as far as this process is we're still pretty early on. Um, but what we have done is we have um, designed a screening survey, which we sent out um, to collect uh, basically background information on people, um, people that use Kubernetes. And we also included a free form response uh, and put in a net promoter score as well. Uh, and we sent this out through the CNCF Twitter um, as a way to um, both qualify these people and just kind of see what their use of containers and Kubernetes is, um, but also, um, you know, for the eight weeks that we ran this survey of the 1800 people that responded, uh, 41 of those agreed to be contacted. So what we're gonna be doing next is setting up qualitative interviews with these people. Um, but we also wanted to share um, from the survey that we that we sent out the data that came back because we also think that this is super interesting um, that talks about a little bit about how people uh, use Kubernetes and containers. And so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Carl and Carl is going to take us through uh, the analysis that he did on the survey. Thanks, Gabby. So yeah, we collected all of this data to, to get a background for some of these folks that we hope to interview down the road. Um, and we got people from all over the world, mainly Europe and North America, but a few people from Asia, Australia, and South and Central America as well. Uh, for the organization type, we have a lot of people that didn't fit into the buckets of consultant or managed service provider. So we could could be any other kind of organization. Um, had the fewest consultants and um, still a good number of managed service providers as well. And we also looked at people's job function and their role. So the job function is on the left and the role is on the right. Uh, so we primarily have software architects, DevOps management, and backend developers. Uh, that is kind of the, the three that are leading the pack there. But we did get a really, really wide spread. So we have some things that are uh, probably a lot less 
common when you think of Kubernetes, um, such as sales or marketing. So there are uh, a pretty pretty um, wide set of people that responded to this, although most of the people are some of the more typical titles that come to mind. Uh, we mostly had individual contributors or consultants, um, but we still got a good number of uh, managers or, or directors as well. So um, we're hoping that we can talk to people that are both in the IC roles and in more of the, the management roles as well when we do these interviews. For the environments that these folks had, um, by far and away, people were running quite a few machines. So our biggest bucket was uh, 5,000 or more machines and uh, that's how most people responded. So um, a lot of people were in that highest bucket. Uh, the ones that were lower are kind of uh, surprisingly evenly spread. So if we end up running a survey like this again, I imagine we might um, you know, maybe break it up into five to 10,000 and then more than 10,000. So people are running a lot of machines in their Kubernetes environments. For the data center types, uh, most people are running in public cloud, but a lot of people are also running private cloud or on-premises as well for our respondents. Um, a lot fewer running hybrid cloud. Um, and one person wrote in a response, bare metal cube admin, which I would imagine would probably end up being bucketed with um, private cloud. But yeah, mostly public or private. Hybrid is definitely there, but not as strong as the other two. We also looked at activities. So what people are actually uh, doing with Kubernetes when they're working in it. So uh, this sort of teal blue color is when people are very involved with the item. Red is when they're somewhat involved and orange is when uh, they're not at all involved. So the things that people were most likely to be involved with were working with infrastructure resources, researching, evaluating, purchasing new tech, monitoring and troubleshooting applications, managing deployment pipelines, managing a cloud platform, developing software and architecting software. Uh, people were less likely to be involved in working with AI or machine learning systems. And um, people were kind of just somewhat involved with uh, managing data processes, which I imagine is somewhat aligned with the folks that actually are working more with the AI and ML systems. And for Kubernetes use, uh, the, it would make sense given who we uh, who we sampled for this, but um, people are currently using um, Kubernetes across proof of concept to production uh, by far and away. So it's kind of interesting that folks don't really give up on the proof of concept. They're still um, trying out new things within Kubernetes, even when they're running it in production. Um, a lot of people have uh, moved past proof of concept for future plans, which means it might be, you know, somewhat more cemented in the way that people are um, using Kubernetes in their, in their work environments. And so we also looked at what resources people use to learn um, about Kubernetes. Documentation is uh, very, very strongly in the lead here, um, but everything else also has um, a good showing. So these other ones are, are fairly even, but Twitter is pretty common. This might be a little biased because we did send this out via Twitter. Um, but everything else is again, pretty even. So people are going everywhere from YouTube to Stack Overflow. A lot of people wrote in um, other responses and they were more likely to mention uh, specific resources in those other comments. So maybe like a specific person on YouTube or a specific book or something like that. But um, documentation is still definitely the leader where people are going to learn about Kubernetes. And finally, uh, the net promoter score is something we asked about. So you've probably seen one of these um, multiple times. It's where a company will email you or give you a pop-up and it'll say, how likely are you to recommend our product to a colleague or friend? And then you answer on a scale of uh, zero to 10, 10 being um, more likely to, to recommend that product. So this is a really, really common uh, marketing or customer experience measurement to gauge general sentiment towards a brand or product. And it's calculated in this way where if people answer a nine or 10, they're called a promoter. This is our green bucket. Uh, passive is seven or eight, and that's kind of the middle bucket. And then detractor is zero to six. And the way that you calculate this score in the industry standard way 
is you kind of throw out the passives, uh, you take the percentage of promoters, and then you subtract the percentage of detractors, and uh, you end up with this percentage score. And so our percentage score that we came up with for Kubernetes is 62.5. And the scale actually goes from negative 100 to positive 100. So this is fairly high. And considering across uh, most industries, this is actually a super, super high NPS score, which is really interesting. Uh, we looked in a little bit to see if we could find data around other open source projects that might have been measured in this way, but it doesn't seem to be a very common metric to be used on open source projects. So we don't know if this is, you know, relatively high or low compared to other open source projects, but across the board, this is a, a very, very high score, which shows a lot of engagement from um, the people that use Kubernetes. And uh, that's it for the data. So I'll give it back to Gabby. Thank you. Cool, thanks Carl. Um, and just to wrap up, um, as far as next steps for us on the jobs to be done study, uh, right now we're working on setting up user inter interviews like we mentioned uh, from the people that responded to the survey. Uh, out of that will come you know, a lot of analysis, um, kind of going back through responses and extracting out um, that job map that I showed at the beginning and also um, understanding what those desired outcomes are. Uh, ultimately, we'll put all of this in a survey um, and send it out again. And after doing analysis on the results of that survey, we'll be able to generate this like very nice um, opportunity landscape that, that I talked about in the beginning. Uh, so with that, that's pretty much it. Thank you for uh, coming to our talk and um, let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, and uh, we'd love to have, so all of this data is going to be open sourced. Uh, we look forward to sharing it with everyone who's interested. Um, and then if you wanna chat more about with us about what we're doing and how you can get engaged, uh, definitely uh, join our Slack channel and uh, check out the Google group and we'd love to chat more. So. And uh, we're happy to answer any questions people have uh, in the audience now uh, that the chat talks over. Thanks.